For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. This morning's message is entitled, In the World or of the World. In the World or of the World. Uh, We are coming to the close now of the series, The Whole Truth. Um, There'll just be one more message next week to close out this, uh, this series. It's uh, it's 12 parts, and I know it seemed like it's gone on forever. There's been interruptions along the way, and uh, that's all just the nature of the beast here at Central. But uh, this will be the next week, will be the closing message in the series, The Whole Truth. And I trust you've been blessed and encouraged by the, uh, by the uh, discussions, the Bible studies that we've been having together. Well, a conference uh, on life values for high school and college students was conducted. And in that particular conference, it included a a mock auction. And uh, each student was given about $700 to bid with. Uh, How much did each item get auctioned off for? Well, here were some of the items and here were some of the bids. Intellectual status was auctioned for $650. Uh, The value of working alone was auctioned off for $400 or $450. Profit and Gain bought several bids for the full $700. And when they bid, when they put out Community, there were no bid, no takers at all for Community. We might say, perhaps, that the students in this particular mock auction had accepted the world's values. But how could they help it? To be in this world is simply to be influenced by its value system. Even when Christians don't realize it, the world impresses on us its own value system. Now, the imposing of this system of values has been so successful that the word world has itself changed in tone. There was a time when the, world, uh, when the term worldly was a negative term. It meant to a person probably engaged in sinful, hedonistic acts like dancing and smoking and drinking, etc., that Christians were taught to avoid. In fact, most enjoyable activities were looked upon suspiciously. Deep down, people feared that if it is enjoyable, it must be ultimately sinful. Today, being known as a man or woman of the world is actually desirable. It refers to someone who's been around and understands how things operate. Pleasure has come out of the closet and it came out of the closet a long time ago and it's become the explicit goal and justification for many activities that used to be thought of as being improper. No one wants to necessarily be naive, nor do we want to be suspicious of all pleasure, but isn't the Bible rather negative about the world? And how should Christians relate to the world today? When Christians try to understand their role in the world, one phrase quickly comes to mind, being in the world, but not of the world. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 17, as we look at these well-known words, yet poorly understood expression, um, that uh, we get this phrase, being in the world, not of it, from. uh, John chapter 17, and we're looking at the prayer of Jesus, and we'll read verses 11 through 16. John 17, verses 11 through 16. Jesus said, now I am no longer in the world, but these, talking about his disciples, are in the world. And I came to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name, those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 13, but now I come to you and these things, 
Uh, and these things I speak in the world, that ye may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, just because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I do not pray that they should, you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world world. The confusion over how Christians are to relate to the world is due to the misunderstanding or at least vagueness in the meaning of the word world. The term has a variety of uses in the Bible. In fact, the expression in the world but not of the world assumes two different uses of the word in the two halves of the statement. Uh, first of all, the word can, the word world can be positive or at least used in a neutral sense or a descriptive term. It can be referred to planet Earth on which we live, as in Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Often it is used to refer to people, such as in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. That's right. It can be used of the normal course of human activity, such as in 1 John 3.17, where the goods of this world are used to refer to material possessions. Or 1 Corinthians 7, 29-31, where world refers to activities such as marriage, joy, sorrow, and, of course, business. Then the word world can also take on a negative meaning. It can refer to the material world and all things seen as objects unfit for human devotion compared to living for Jesus Christ. As in Mark 8, verse 36, when Jesus said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And probably the strongest expressions related to, the, to this view are found in a couple of Bible passages. Turn with me to James chapter 4 and verse 4, if you would. James chapter 4 and verse 4, and then we're going to go over a few pages to 1 John chapter 2. The strongest expressions related to this view are found in these couple of passages. James chapter 4 and verse 4. Notice what James wrote. He said, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. God. Now turn over to 1 John chapter 2, if you would, verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. John wrote, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world." And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, both of these verses uh, use the word world to describe the human desire for pleasure, for possessions, and for the display of extravagance and pride. Now, of course, the root of this desire is the carnal mind, what the, what, what the Bible calls, what Paul wrote as the carnal mind or the, the flesh, an existence that takes no consideration for God or opposes God, you see. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul said, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And obviously, the, the love, love for the world in 1 John chapter 2 does not mean the same as what it means in John chapter 3, verse 16, when God said, for God so loved the world. Several texts, especially in John, go one step further and include the connotation of hostility toward God and His people, such as in John chapter 15 and verse 8. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The world is also seen as being under the rule of an evil power and a place of conflict, as in uh, John 12, uh, now is the judgment of this world, now is the ruler of this world cast out. Now, it's important uh, to be clear about what these negative uses of the word world are not saying. Generally, two wrong conclusions are drawn. First is a negative view of people. When people uh, hear uh, the, some of these negative statements made about the world in Scripture, People, some people tend to view people negatively, which has caused some people to give up 
entirely on the human race. The, this extreme, the extreme of this attitude can often lead to disdain and rejection of others as completely unworthy and worthless. Now, it's interesting uh, that the same biblical writers who made negative statements about the world also speak of a God who loves the world, reconciling, a God who reconciles the world to himself and sending people, his people, to proclaim the good news to the world. Separation from God and hostility toward him do not cancel out the fact that human, humanity is created in the image of God and that Christ came to die for the sins of the world. He still loves us and he is still seeking to rescue and save humanity, you see. The second wrong conclusion that is drawn from these negative uses of the word world in the Bible is that creation itself therefore must be bad. Uh, since some elements of creation may excite human desire to sin, some people have a negative view of the material world. The most common form of this error is to reject all pleasure, especially intimate pleasure. A husband complained that his wife thought intimacy was, was at best a necessary evil and sought to limit the occasion as much as possible. But that's an old, old story. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul addresses some in Corinth who thought, who think that even though married, they should not be intimate. Paul would not permit that particular attitude. The Bible doesn't reject this pleasure as evil. What the Bible rejects is illicit sexual activity and uh, any perversion of the same. Nor does the Bible suggest that all pleasure of the material world is actually evil. On the contrary, the Bible, uh, Bible says, uh, the approach of the Bible is that all of God's creation is good. What's required of us is the right use of creation, not its entire rejection. So the number of meanings of world in the Bible can make it difficult to understand what the word means in a particular passage. Occasionally, even the same context, varies, uh, various meanings uh, occur together. For example, in John chapter 1 verse 10, just turn over there with me, John chapter 1 and verse 10, notice there are three different meanings of the word world in this one passage, John, or in this one verse, John chapter 1 and verse 10. It says here that uh, Jesus... Jesus was in the world. What world, is he ref what, what, what world is John referring to here? He's just simply referring to planet Earth, correct? The, the place where Jesus came to live, the place where you and I live. Jesus came to the world. Jesus was in the world and the world was made through him. What world is he talking about here? He's talking about creation. He's talking about those things, animate and inanimate objects, creation. All, the world was made through him, but the world did not know him. What world is he referring to there? He's referring to, he's referring to people of planet Earth, specifically in this context, the Jews of his time, you see. And so, uh, as always, the meaning of a particular word must be determined by its immediate context or its context. Nowhere is that more true than with the word world. So keep that in mind as we study and as we look at being what it means to be in the world but not of the world here this morning. Now, turn back with me to John 17, verse 11. John 17, 11, in Jesus' prayer, recorded by John, he states, John 17, verse 11, he states, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. These are in the world. Now, almost any meaning of world could be understood in the phrase, in the world. We are in the universe, on planet Earth, among people. We have lived a life apart from God or have been hostile to God. But by paying close attention to this particular context, the last two options are altogether excluded. The disciples are to view themselves as in the world as in the same way that Jesus was in the world. In other words, we live in the midst of the human race. We live in the midst of the human race. The fact that we are in the world must be squarely faced by Christians, by each one of us. Too many Christians sometimes attempt to deny their humanity, but this little phrase, in the world, will not permit it. We have the same frailties, the same needs, the same desires as everybody else. We live in the world with all of its problems and with all of its pleasures. 
We share life with people of every sort, and I mean every sort, many of whom live as though God does not even exist. Many are hostile to God, and in certain universities, professors won't allow their students to mention God at whatsoever. And yet, on the other hand, there are many people who are seeking to, to fill that God-shaped void in their own lives. We, friends, are in the world, and any attempt to deny or to diminish the presence is unrealistic and can be very harmful to our Christian witness. We are not in the world, we are, we are in the world rather, but Jesus goes on to say that, but we are not of the world. We are in the world, and that must be squarely faced, but we are not of the world, and that also must be squarely faced. Or another way of putting it, we are not from this world. Uh, just as Jesus was not from this world, according to John chapter 17, verse 14. Notice what he said, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, some folk might think that you're an alien or you've come down from another planet, but that's not what Jesus is referring to here. And we'll uh, unpack this a little bit as we go on. If you go over to the next chapter in John chapter 18 and verse 36, Jesus told Pilate that his kingdom was not from or of this world. He didn't mean, as some people have thought, that the kingdom of God had nothing to do with this world. On the contrary, his kingdom did not have its origin in this world. And that's what Jesus was referring to. His kingdom comes from above, from God, and therefore does not operate according to this world's standards, according to this world's scheme of things. An appropriate, perhaps a, an appropriate paraphrase of this idea of being in the world but not of the world could be you are not of this world. The, the driving force behind your life is not this world, but it is God and His Word. That might be a better paraphrase. The driving force behind your life is not this world, the things of this world, but it is God. Therefore, being in the world but not of it means that you are, that we are humans among human beings, but we are not determined by human life as if that was all there was. Christians are those who seek to live their lives that are determined by Jesus Christ and His Holy Word. This is what, this is what it means to say that Jesus is Lord of our lives. He desires uh, his desire, He determines rather the goal and the direction of each of our lives. And His death and His resurrection are the patterns by which we live our lives. Christians, according to Philippians 3, 20, have their true citizenship where? All the way up there in heaven. According to Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, we are strangers and we are pilgrims wandering through this land. Colossians 3, 2 and 3, we are to think on things above, not on the things of this world. We no longer, according to Galatians 2, 20, we no longer live, but Christ lives in us and we live the life that we live, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave Himself for us, you see. That's what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. We'll unpack this a little further. The desire and temptation to be conformed to the world around us are very real, but they should not control us or determine who we are or what we do. The world, that is the human scheme of things of which we are all a part, attempts to determine every aspect of our lives. And the devil, the enemy of souls, seeks to, do this, seeks to use that to cause us to come undone. Messages are sent in thousand different ways instructing us as to what is valuable and what deserves our, what deserves our, our attention and our affections. A recent movie came out, it was called Old Fashioned. And a movie critic reviewed the movie the movie was about a man who had a, a young adult man who had a sordid past, who when finding God made some very real changes in his life, especially in the way he related to women. He had two complaints, this critic, about the movie. He could not imagine anyone doing the things that this man did in treating women respectfully and nicely and guarding his purity. And he felt also that the movie was preachy. Shockingly, he failed to realize that we get preached at all the time, whether it be in the movies, in TV shows, in books, in magazines, in newspapers, in songs, in plays, in social media. What the movie reviewer was apparently reacting to 
was the discomfort, his discomfort with the message that was behind the preaching. All mediums of communication offer some perspective of life, whether explicitly or implicitly. Often the messages are just blatant. For example, sexual promiscuity, it's okay. Lying and being greedy, that's fine. Living for yourself, hey, that's the only way to go. But at other times, the message is far more subtle, but it's there. Some years ago, a hotel boasted of its conveniences in an ad that read, man does not live by room service alone. So you see, the specialists of this form of preaching are advertisers. Advertisers whose goal is to manipulate us as efficiently as possible to purchase a certain product. Now, I'm not suggesting that all messages sent to us are bad and sinful. We can't escape the attempt of the world to determine our lives. Apple growers, they want us to eat more apples. Car manufacturers, they want us to purchase their cars, you see. Uh, if, we, if we were to close off avenues, every avenue of communication, there'll be numerous others that we don't even realize. Being in the world means being bombarded by messages about the way the world does things. And some of the messages may be viewed legitimately. For example, that orange detergent may actually be better than the one you presently have. A lot will, though, have to be faced squarely and rejected if it does not fit into a life that is ordered by Jesus Christ. When the message, when the message in life is a game of sexual conquest, for example, Christians should not be duped into playing. I've got a few crucial questions that I want to put up on the board here, up on the screen for us here. What determines our way of life? These are crucial questions we need to answer. What determines our way of life? Is it the world and your own desires or is it Christ and His Word? Whose sermons are you buying into? Are you buying into the Sermon on the Mount or are you buying into the sermon that's on the TV and on the internet? Now, there is another problem. Not only are we in the world, there is a sense in which the world is in us. If the word world means a life apart from God, it points primarily to a life shaped by human desires and a life shaped by human pride. We are all guilty of that. And sometimes it's easy to see the messages of the world in sending from the outside without realizing that the world is sending from the inside. We may be separate from the world outside only to determine the world inside. Someone flees and runs from the city only to carry what is in their heart with them and they are distressed and don't know what's going on. We often feel, uh, and Christians often feel this kind of tension acutely when it has to do with material wealth. Christians claim to be citizens of heaven but are often influenced by this world's values in houses and in cars than by Christ and our concern and, or His concern for those who are less fortunate and His mission. Someone once said that he had a friend that had, been very, uh, had a very attractive house and was always doing something to decorate the house. Uh, she would often tell him that she was a pilgrim and a stranger passing through this world. And uh, he couldn't help tease her at times by suggesting that if she was a pilgrim and stranger traveling through the world, that she did so in style. You see, there is a balance between enjoying God's creation and caring for the things that God cares about, His work on earth, His mission, evangelism, and caring for those who are least fortunate. However you determine to resolve this in your own life, you must be careful that your choices must be determined by your commitment to Jesus rather than the influences around you. Now, some Christians resolve the issue of how we are to relate to the world by stressing the importance of being separate the phrase, separate from the world, doesn't exactly, isn't exactly found in the Scriptures. The phrase, it's not exactly there, but the theme of separating ourselves from defilement, defilement is very frequent. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. This is a classic text on this theme. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 7, verse 1. That's not too many verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 7, 1. Notice what Paul wrote. He said, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer 
with an unbeliever. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. So obviously, separation is crucial. But what does that mean? What does that look like? How far should a Christian go in separating themselves from the world in which they live? Uh, The ancient Qumran uh, community from which we received the Dead Sea Scrolls went so far as to move out into the desert and establish an independent community. As a family, uh, my family, we visited the Ephrata Cloister while we were living in Pennsylvania. It's one of America's earliest religious communities founded in 1732 by German settlers seeking to uh, spiritual goals rather than earthly rewards. They decided the best way to do that was to cut themselves off from the world outside them. Monasteries and convents share the same ideal. In the past, some individuals became hermits for God. Some of you have probably read about Simon Stylites or Stylitis, who lived 30 years on top of a pillar to avoid contamination with the world around him. I wouldn't have liked to have been on top of that pillar. Today, Amish people are an example of Christians who take very seriously the idea that biblical separation means rejecting modern conveniences and wearing plain clothes. The Quakers, they use the words thee and thou as a way to mark off their language from that of others. And some Christians refuse to vote on certain issues or be involved in any non-Christian organization because they think their involvement with a secular system will compromise their faith. It wasn't too long ago that some Christians in this country practice separation other, for other reasons other than to live holy lives. Unfortunately, white Christians in the South form private Christian schools rather than having their children in racially integrated schools. In the North, many Christians did the same thing by moving from the city to the suburbs. If a person fears those who are different and sees them as a threat or either security uh, to either security or purity, separation can be a likely option. In the world or of the world? It's a good question. Jesus encouraged us to be in but not of. So what does that look like? The Bible offers five guiding principles that we're going to discuss in next week's presentation. So we look forward to seeing you then. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.